Okay, so I know it's a little late, but um, yes, I am recording. Thank you, Joel. I can count on you. Um, so, um, any questions over anything? Lab one, lab two, uh, lab three for that matter. I have graded lab one. Um, you should be able to see comments that I made on your lab. So if uh, there is uh, there are points that were taken out and you don't know why, there should be comments next to that to, to that question. Um, so take a look at that. Make sure you understand you know what went wrong, so that we can improve on next lab, uh, the next lab report. Um, any questions? Okay. Um, again, as always, just if you, uh, you come up with a question, you can interrupt at any, at any minute. No, I don't mind. Uh, what I want to do is I want to go over lab three, which is due next Saturday. And uh, I think this is a pretty straightforward lab. I think it's very uh, pretty easy, uh, which is good because I think we need an easy lab. Um, essentially, what's going to look, what, what we're going to explore is what we call aseptic techniques. And we should know from a uh, lecture, actually, that aseptic techniques are the um, techniques uh, that allows us to avoid contamination of our lab exercise, of our cultures, et cetera. And, and what, what that means is that we want to keep out the organisms from the environment um, that shouldn't be in our experiment. and we want to keep anything that should be sterile, sterile. So in the laboratory, we grow bacteria in what we call media, medium. Medium is singular, media is plural. So media are uh, the substances into which we grow bacteria. Most bacteria that we work with in a laboratory are easy to grow in that they can grow what we call um, complex media and complex media are is just a substance that has a lot of nutrients. It doesn't specify exactly how much and what the nutrients are. Uh, complex media may say something like uh, it has uh, beef broth. Okay, well, what is beef broth? You know, it's got proteins. It probably has some carbs, some sugar, but it doesn't say exactly what it has. You may have yeast extract. Okay, what is a yeast extract? So that's basically what complex media is. It is inexpensive. Um, most is you know, typically that's the, uh, the the media that's most used, and uh, it serves well for most microorganisms. Some organisms, however, have more specific growth requirements, and those bacteria are going to need defined media. Uh, defined media is typically expensive because it gives us the exact um, ingredients and the amounts. So it's a very precise medium. But again, most of the time, complex media is all we need. So we grow organisms in complex media. Uh, there's one called nutrient agar, for example, or actually is nutrient broth. And then if we want to solidify it, we're going to add agar, and then it will become nutrient agar. Agar, agar is a solidifying agent, which we'll talk about here in a minute. Okay. Uh, TSA, triptych soy agar, is another one, or triptych soy broth, TSB. So these are just complex media that are used a lot in, in, in microbiology. Now, um, one of the uh, challenges uh, in microbiology is that microorganisms are everywhere. And they, in their natural environment, they typically are found in mixed populations. Uh, the fact that organisms are everywhere, um, that means that we have to be aware of their presence and try to follow aseptic techniques so that we don't contaminate our cultures because we cannot sterile environment. Uh, the gloves are not going to be a sterile environment. Uh, if we speak, you know, the, the, we're always uh, spitting and even if we don't see it, uh, uh, there are microorganisms coming out of our mouth. A dust has microorganisms, they're everywhere. Um, now, typically, when we are trying to identify the identity 
quantity of a microorganism will grow in a pure culture as opposed to a mixed culture. A mixed culture is the uh, a culture that has many organisms growing together. And that is typically how we find them in the environment. And this is something important for the lab practical. Given a plate, a picture of a plate uh, with different kinds of bacteria colonies, you should be able to determine whether that is show, the plate is showing you a mixed culture or a culture. In a mixed culture, you're going to see different uh, types of colonies. So essentially, this is what happens. Whenever you inoculate a plate, one single little bacterial cell or my microbial cell, it could be a yeast, um, would fall on the plate or you would put it on the plate and over a period of uh, 18, 24 hours, that little cell grows and uh, doubles and uh, by binary fission. So it goes through uh, rounds of replication. And 18, 24 hours later, there are enough cells in that area that have come from that one cell where you're going to attain a visible colony. So a colony is not one cell, but is about, you know, at least a million cells, if not more. I mean, this is a huge colony that might have 100 million cells. So these are uh, groups of cells, but the key to a colony is that they came from one cell, or one colony forming unit that replicated to form that visible colony. So again, a colony is not just one cell, but it is millions of cells, all coming from one entity. So what you can say is that one colony came from one cell, therefore all of the organisms in that colony are exactly the same. So we, yeah, go ahead, Joel. question. <clears throat> Yes, can, can I define C A correct? So a colony forming unit is the entity that gives rise to a colony. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So the question is, can you define a, col a CFU? CFU it stands for, what is TJE unit? You're talking about CFU? Okay, I'm going to assume it's TJE. Okay. I'm sorry, uh, I don't know that I understand. Is, is that TJE correct? Oh, no problem. All right, so what is CFU? Um, the acronym stands for Colony Forming Unit, and it refers to an entity, one entity, and, and I'm, I'm going to find this here a little bit better here in just a second, one entity uh, from which the colony arose. Um, the reason why I did say one cell, okay, you could say one cell. However, um, the reason why instead of calling it the one cell that are from which the colony arose, instead of saying that we say a colony forming unit is because we acknowledge the fact that it could be possible that instead of one cell, there may be two cells that fell in that area and all of the cells in the colony came from those two cells. So acknowledging the fact that it could be one cell or maybe a small group of cells from which that colony arose, that's what we don't say, we do not say cell forming unit, we say the colony forming unit. Or I should say we don't say the colony forming cell, we say the colony forming unit. Because we do know that even though we, in theory, say that one cell gave rise to one colony, in practice, we know that that may not be true, that it is possible that two little cells ended up at close proximity and the two of them were the ones who formed that particular colony. Having said that, um, even if it is two cells, those two cells would have been of the same, the same type of bacteria. Otherwise, you would end up with something like here, you know, two colonies that are like that one and that one that are definitely different growing together. Um, so that, that would have been two different, let me kind of clean that up a little bit so we can see it again. So in this area, 
uh, when you look at the plate, this plate right here, this area right here has actually um, two different organisms growing. It has the red one and the yellow one. So clearly, two different cells fell in that area, and one of them gave rise to that reddish tree, and the other one gave rise to gave rise to the purple colony. So in general, each type of microorganism has its own distinctive colony as far as color, as far as size, and other characteristics. So you can take a look at this plate, and you can say, OK, this is one organism here, this large yellow colony. Then there's that one. There's a tiny white one. There's a little bit of a bigger white one. That Those could be different organisms. There's another white one here, but this one looks more translucent than the other little white ones look more like milk droplets. Um, so I can see just by looking at this plate at least one, two, three, four, at least five different color, uh, organisms right there. So colony forming unit is the entity from which the colony arose. Uh, we don't say cell because it may be possible that it might have been more than one cell. However, having said that, we look at colonies as pure cultures. So we look at uh, let's see a good one like this yellow colony here. That is a pure culture. We assume every single cell in that colony, they're all from the same genus, species, and more importantly, strain. And they're all from the same strain because they came from one CFU. Because you can say that yellow and this yellow and this yellow, all these yellow colonies look like they come from the same genus and species of microorganism. However, they could be different strains. And this, and this strain could be different from this strain right here, even though the genus and species is the same. hope that makes sense. So a colony is a pure culture. It is the same um, genus, species, and strain. So. This plate right here is hopefully clearly a mixed culture, whereas this plate right here is a pure culture. In a pure culture, um, you have all of the organisms coming from the same genus and species, and if you made the pure culture correctly, even the same strain. And one of the ways we make a pure culture is we, can't, we, we make it from one colony. So that's one colony. And we take a little bit of that colony and we transfer it to another plate in order to obtain isolated colonies. Uh, that is a pure culture plate. Okay. So in the lab practical, you should be able to uh, distinguish a pure culture plate from a mixed culture plate. You should be able to um, a. Uh, sorry, I'm sorry. I was just uh, looking at something. Um, we will be able to, um, uh, let's see, um, the, uh, look at a plate and determine, oh, yeah, this is a pure culture plate, this is a mixed culture plate, okay? All right, so that's one of the things that we need to get out of this lab. Uh, yeah, and, and another thing is that if you're growing a, 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 a culture in a broth, that culture is, um, you cannot tell whether it's mixed or pure because it's in a liquid medium. Okay, so you cannot tell whether that particular culture is a, uh, uh, you, you cannot see colonies. So you don't know whether it's mixed or not. Um, if the liquid from one colony, if you made the liquid culture from one colony, as long as you didn't, uh, as long as you as you follow aseptic techniques, you can say, OK, this is a pure culture because it came from one colony. And if you follow aseptic techniques, it should have only one organism in there. But the only way to make sure is this right here, is to put it on a plate and see the colonies growing. Make sure there are no two types. OK. So this is these are some of the ways we make pure cultures. We take one colony and you and see the here is telling you, okay, we have two different kinds of organisms here, an E. coli and Macrococcus luteus. You want to make a pure culture of E. coli, you'll take one E. coli colony and transfer it into a broth, let the broth grow, and now you have a pure culture 
nutrient broth culture of that E. coli. Okay, so uh, we can collect organisms from the environment. Uh, typically, when we collect from the environment, we're collecting from mixed cultures. Um, and then in a teaching lab, we can actually purchase microorganisms. Yeah, is there a benefit of using one medium agar or broth for pure, for pure cultures? Yeah, there is. Uh, in general, plates are more expensive. Um, and they are a little bit harder to keep because they dry out. So they're not going to keep themselves for very long. Uh, within a matter of you know, two weeks, they're going to be dry, dry or on their way to being dry, whereas a broth lasts longer and it's cheaper. So it's a, it's a mixture of uh, shelf life and expense. So we typically keep cultures in a broth. However, if we need to see whether indeed we have a pure culture, we have to transfer it to a plate. So they both have their, their, their benefits and you know, their, their uses. But for long-term keeping of a culture, a broth is better because it's cheaper and it, and it keeps longer. Um, in a medical lab, however, when a specimen arrives, most medical specimens are going to be mixed cultures. And one of the organisms in there, I mean, not always, but most of the time, uh, or many times, uh, and, and out of the organisms growing, maybe only one of them is, is the one that's causing the infection. So in a, in a medical lab, you always plate uh, your specimens in, in an agar plate because you want to see colonies. You want to see the organisms actually growing. Okay. All right, so that's just saying that once you, you have the organism inoculated into a broth, then you place the broth in a incubator in order to grow it. And that's something we're going to be doing throughout the semester is incubating plates like you did in this, or you, or you, or you are going to do in this aseptic techniques lab if you haven't done it already. Um, you need to get used to the temperatures, uh, 37 degrees centigrade. Um, we do work with degrees centigrade. 37 degrees centigrade is body temperature. Um, whereas 25 degrees centigrade is room temperature. Um, and you have to be mindful of the temperatures because the um, higher temperatures will dry out quicker than, than uh, lower temperatures. Also, um, you want to put the organisms at a temperature that they like, otherwise you're not going to get to grow. Uh, low temperatures, 4 to 6 degrees centigrade, that is refrigerator temperature, and that slows down the organisms uh, so that you can keep them longer. So what we do is we typically grow organisms at a high temperature, 37 or 25 degrees centigrade. Once they have grown, we take the medium and stick it in the refrigerator. That doesn't kill the organism, it slows it down so that it will last longer. Um, okay, so know, know the uh, temperatures, know what degrees are typically used to grow, what, at what temperature do we just keep the um, uh, the uh, uh, organisms alive. Um, okay, so uh, that's just uh, you know, what was labeled the plates at the at the bottom. So a, a nutrient agar plate. This is the bottom of the plate, and the agar where the organism is going to be grown on the on the surface is like a blob of gelatin that has been poured on the plate and then allowed to solidify. And the lid of the plate is typically loose. So this doesn't close tightly because we need oxygen to go in. Most organisms are going to need oxygen. So the lid kind of falls loosely on top of the bottom. Um, organisms are going to grow on the surface of the agar, as you saw in the pictures. And because uh, we don't want contamination and the li lid is loose, then uh, contaminants could go in and fall in there. So for that reason, instead of keeping plates right side down, we always keep them upside down. So we incubate the plates upside down, so we put them upside down. There's the lid right here, so that the uh, agar portion is on top, like that. And that does two things. It allows us to prevent contamination, because things don't fall up, they fall down. So it would be impossible for something or 
unlikely for air to come in and you know contaminate. It's going to contaminate the lid, but it's not going to contaminate the agar. Um, also, moisture builds on the lid oftentimes, and if you had it right side up, the moisture could fall on the plate and contaminate it. The other reason that it's important to keep it upside down is that we label the plate at the bottom right here. So this is what it's going to be labeled. So and so since you're keeping it upside down and you're labeling it at the bottom, you can easily see the label and say, oh yeah, this is this plate, that's that plate. Whereas um, we never label the lid because the plate is going to be kept upside down. And if you label the lid, you won't be able to read what's on the plate. Not to mention, in a real lab, this happens once in a while, lids fall. And if you have two lids that fall, all of a sudden you don't know which lid goes to which plate. So just for practical reasons. But you do need to know, why do we keep plates upside down? Why do we label at the bottom? You know, those are just your basic um, how-tos you know, in the lab. Um, Loops or needles can be used to collect. Yeah, we collect the sample typically with a loop. Most of the time, it's going to be a little wire with a little loop at the end, and we're going to put the loop in the in the medium. Uh, we can dip it in the broth, and that's all you need to to grab enough bacteria to transfer to a new medium. Or uh, you can even use a needle, which we do that once in a while. But most of the time, it's a loop. Um, you need to wear, you know, use the safety techniques. The loop is going to be flamed to um, sterilize. Um, and um, and then you need to let it cool, and that's important because if you try to pick your bacteria when the um, when the uh, loop is um, too hot, you're gonna kill it. Um, okay. So that's an important uh, important uh, principle. Um, let me just say again. All right. So you should know the flamed, let it cool, pick up your bacteria. Um, and uh, if you haven't done the lab yet, the, the, uh, the lab will kind of walk you through what to do. Um, when you pick up the tube to place your bacteria in it, and actually, um, we always, see, I want to I wanna see if I can get a, yeah, okay, there we, okay, so you have your, your loop, let's say you have a tube, um, that's the broth, the bacteria is growing in here, and you want to transfer from that tube growing bacteria to a sterile tube because you want to make a new culture. Okay, first of all, the lid is again loose to allow for um, oxygen to go in. When always flame your loop first, and as you're letting it cool, then you open the cap. So the second thing you'll do is open cap. First, flame loop, okay? In the time that it took for you to open the cap, then you're going to flame the top of the tube to, again, follow septic techniques, kill anything in there, and create these hot air currents that would prevent bacteria in the air from down because hot air rises. It's going to rise away from your tube. Okay, so the reason why you do not open the cap and then flame your loop is because you're leaving the tube open while you're flaming your loop. And that is precious few seconds in which things could be falling in. You want to leave the tube open for as little time as possible. So flame loop, open cap, flame your tube, put your loop in, grab your bacteria, and then worry about the culture always, always first. Flame the, cap, the, the tube again, cap it. You want, the, the principle is you want to leave the cultures open the shortest amount of time possible. The longer you leave them open, the, the more the chances of something falling in. So that's the way you always look at any tube, at any plate. You protect it from it being open longer than necessary. Okay, that's the, the basic principle. 
of, of why things are done in a specific order. And you will be, you know, the, the lab report will ask you the order and I'll be pay attention to the order when, when I'm grading it because the principle is you protect the cultures, you protect the medium. This is a sterile and, you know, you're, and, and you're going to transfer specific bacteria in there. The minute you open that cap, you are risking things from the air in it. You want to you wanna minimize that risk. Okay. That's one of the, uh, the uh, things that we need to get out of that, this lab. And unfortunately, because we're not having, uh, you know, on campus labs, this is not something that becomes very obvious when you're just, you know, doing a virtual lab. Um, and, but this, this does have a, an application. You know, someday you'll be working in a clinical setting and you have to observe aseptic techniques. So you have to be aware of all the risks of contamination around you. And if you're working with something that should be sterile, like, you know, I don't know, a catheter or, or a needle that you're you know, going to insert into a patient, you have to be aware of what you're doing and, and, and what it's being touched and not touched and how long you're exposing it to, you know, to, to a potential contaminant. So anyway, any questions? The other thing I want to do is I want to go over the lab report itself, make sure there are uh, no questions. And if there's anything that I need to point out as I go through it, I'll go ahead and do that. OK. OK. All right, let's see. Um, let's see, da, 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 what is the phrase? Okay, I think a lot of this is pretty. Uh, we've already kind of talked about that. Yeah, keep in mind the laboratory is not a sterile environment unless you make it so, unless you, you know, a loop would be sterile after you flame it. Um, but so what is after you flame it, it is a sterile, but the minute you touch something with it, it stops being a sterile. Um, okay. All right. So I've just kind of gone through all that already. Uh, if you have questions, let me know. I'm just, yeah, we talked about the temperatures. Uh, you know what? I'm going to make this bigger. Uh, I'm going to make it bigger. You won't see it big. I don't, the way I understand it is you do not see that I'm making it bigger. Oh, yeah, there it is. But I'm having a hard time reading these. Okay. All right, let's see. Um, and I, there is something that I do want to talk about, but when I get to it, I'll, I'll, I'll let you know. And I'll mention the steps in preventing cross contamination. Uh, what does it mean? Yeah, in the lab, in the, in the virtual lab, they talk about a streaking a plate. And um, whenever they're telling you to inoculate the plate, to put the bacteria in the plate, um, in subsequent labs, you're going to be taught a specific way of a streaking a plate called streaking for isolation, which is different from what in this lab, what you're doing in this lab. In this lab, you're just putting the bacteria in the plate. It doesn't really matter how. You're just putting it in there. And that's what they're calling it, streaking the plate. Um, yeah, may, be mindful of where you throw things away. You know, go back to lab report one. You know, where did you throw away? You know, contaminated stuff, non-contaminated stuff. Is it a sharp? It's not a sharp. Are we going to use it again? Or are we not going to use it again? Uh, we are going to. You know, you, you need to give the pictures of the uh, plates. Okay, so you are going to sample different environments uh, for bacterial growth. Um, in your uh, in the virtual lab. You do get the results, the amount of bacteria, uh, whether it's more or less. And you can report these in different manners. Um, when you report amount of bacteria, you can, if you want, make your own um, little way of reporting. Uh, I think at the in the virtual lab, they, they give you numbers of bacteria, you know, like uh, zero or you know, 50 to 100 or more than 100 or something like that. And that is absolutely fine. Uh, we may be using other means of reporting later on. Now, when it says color, uh, colony variety, seen or not seen. Okay, when you look at the plates, 
look for whether the organisms grown in the plate, do, do they all look the same? Or do you have different types of colonies growing in there? Maybe some are bigger, some are smaller. It's a little bit hard to see in the plates. So more than color, look for different in sizes and consistency. Maybe some may be opaque, some may be clear, and then determine whether you have uh, pure cultures or mixtures. That's essentially what this is asking for. Do you think you have a pure culture or a mixed culture? Okay, um, now hand washing. Um, ideally, what hand washing is going to do is reduce the number of microorganisms. It's not going to eliminate it. There's no way in the world we're going to eliminate every single organism in our hands because we have normal flora covering our skin, which we're never going to get rid of. So it doesn't matter how much you wash, you're still going to have bacteria. What hand washing is going to do is reduce the number, and more importantly, even than reducing the number, is it's going to get rid of the bacteria that is visiting of the temporary flora that we gather as we're touching things. And the only thing that should be left after we hand wash is normal flora. That's the only thing that should be left, which is actually a pure culture. There's really only one organism, for the most part, that lives in our skin, and that's Staphylococcus epidermidis. Uh, the other ones that are there are very hidden in, in, and that we're not going to really get them by just touching a plate. So hand washing accomplishes two things, reduces the number and gets rid of the transients, the visitors, so that the only thing we have left will be the normal flora. Okay, so that's one thing also I wanted to kind of point out. Um, Second, advantage bacterial load and diversity. Oh, yeah, okay. The, 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 you know, what happens after we disinfect the. Um, and again, not just look for numbers, look also for uh, do we still have the same, uh, many different types of bacteria? We have less diversity. Yeah, it says why is disinfecting with the bench with ethanol not a method of sterilization? The question is is there anything left after we? use the alcohol. Um, Esterilization is going to kill everything. Uh, there should be nothing left if it is something sterilized, including endospores. Everything will be killed. Okay. Um, that. Okay. I think pretty much this is, should be a fairly easy. Let's see what else is there. Um, I think in the transfer and look at it, the material is still okay. All right, any questions? Remove cap. Okay, that's good. We'll talk about that. Oh, and one thing about these is uh, some steps may be used more than once. Okay, so. Uh, you know, removing cap, okay, you might need to use removing cap more than once or, or uh, heat the loop, you might need to use that one more than once. Okay, so it's okay to use the steps more than once. Um, okay. Um, and again, this is just to the steps, pay attention to the steps, pay attention to what you're doing. Uh, the uh, Virtual lab typically tells you if you've contaminated something. Okay. Sad. Um, um, one thing that we're using here. Right. Oh, so I thought somebody had a question. Okay. Um, agar is a solidifying agent. And we use it uh, because it remains solid at 37 degrees centigrade, which is body temperature. And, and it remains solid even at 45 degrees centigrade. So it remains solid at, high, at higher temperatures. Gelatin is a solidifying agent, but it begins to melt at 37 degrees. It will be useless in microbiology. Also, bacteria can eat gelatin, and uh, most bacteria will not eat agar. It's a complex polysaccharide. It will not be eaten by bacteria. Um, okay. 
I think, again, I think this is a pretty easy lab. Okay. Ready? Okay, this should be a fairly easy lab. Um, any questions? Last one here. Uh, the sentence in. Okay. Yeah, you do have a case study afterwards. And um, so don't forget the case study and pay attention to it. And actually, you're kind of carrying the case study through set through a couple of the exercises until you get the answer of it. If I remember correctly, that's basically how, how it works. All right, any questions? Okay, if there are no questions, I think this is it. I mean, it should be an easy lab. I'm going to start grading lab report two tonight. Uh, no, I know by tomorrow you'll start seeing grades. Again, give me a couple of days. They do take a while to grade. Um, other than that, uh, these should be pretty good. So uh, we're going to meet again Thursday to go over lecture. And so we'll wrap up chapter three on Thursday. We may even start chapter four too if we, if we can. Um, we still have time. You know, I think we have another week before we're due for the test. So we're okay. But uh, nonetheless, uh, we'll definitely wrap up chapter three. Okay. Um, we're going to go ahead and sign off. If you have any questions, uh, let me know. Uh, if we still have problems with these Blackboard Collaborate recordings, I'm going to have to continue downloading them on YouTube. So it may take me a while to post them. Um, but hopefully we won't have problems this time. We'll see. Okay. Any questions? Good night. See you on Thursday. Good night, guys.